Good evening, Venerable, Dharma brothers and sisters. My name is Denise. A warm welcome to tonight's Dharma talk, titled Chan Hak Chan Hak. Tonight's talk is jointly hosted by Bowen Chan Singapore and Buddhist Light Association Singapore. I'd like to request for your kind cooperation to ensure that your mobile is turned to a silent book. Thank you very much. All art is artifice. When we look at a painting or a statue, we thought that it's real. But it is just paper with colour or a piece of stone that has been carved. Hello everyone. Yeah, um, welcome back for those who have attended my doc talk yesterday. And then for those who are new over here today, well, just be prepared, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so they know what, what they're laughing at. Okay, now, um, just before we start, you see this marshmallow? Yeah, this is a special treat from the organizer. Um, well, later you know why. <laughs> Everything don't come free. Okay, there's no free lunch, but there'll be free dinner. Okay, let's see. Just for those, um, for the sake of those who have not been here yesterday, just a very brief outline introduction of what I'm going to say for today. Basically, um, this is my main theme talking about Chan, okay, Chan Buddhism and how it related to our heart or mind and then to the art and of course I'll make use again with some of the Gong An and how it relates back to your daily life. Now let's go on to the, the slide. Okay, this one um, which was a drawing of Bodhidharma. Okay. Um, why I've chosen this is because um, from his look and of course with all those simple strokes it best describe what Bodhidharma is like. So that's why we make use of this. I mentioned that yesterday. Okay. Now let's go on with this. What happened is that um, this um, Master Chan Master uh, Long Tan Chong Xing. Uh, before he became a monk, he set up a stand selling cakes next to this uh, Chan Master Tian Huang Tao Wu. And he was really poor, he don't have a place to live and whatever. So he decided, you know, ask help from this uh, Master Tao Wu and give him a room to stay. And to show his gratitude, Chong Sing sent 10 cakes to Master Tao Wu every day. Now, what does this cake got to do with my marshmallow over here? Any idea? <laughs> okay, so what happens is that, of course, I don't know what kind of cake they are using. I'm using marshmallow. Now, you can open up and try and taste it. Please. I hope every one of you have taken your dinner already. Okay, so we have extra. You you don't have enough. Yes, yes, yes. We have some more. Okay, 
Now, let's see this marshmallow. When you eat, what's your feelings toward this thing? Sweet. What else? Soft. What else? Gratitude. Okay. Some more. What else? Question mark. Question mark. <laughs> you remember your your that that sound of one hand yesterday? Okay. So when you're eating this biscuit, uh, your this marshmallow, what what's that all up in your mind? If you have been applying the the sound of one hand that I mentioned yesterday, you know that you know. Okay, this tastes sweet. You know, I like this. I don't like this. There's like some. No, I'm, I'm very full. I just taken my dinner. I don't want to eat it. You know that kind of things. All that kind of discriminative mind started creeping out, and then you're thinking, "Hey, what's up over here? Why she give us this marshmallow?" So some of you may may be asking this kind of question. So if you have been thinking about that, sorry, you already fall into my trap. <laughs> yeah. Actually. I don't have any special purpose and meaning. Just enjoy it. That's what Chan is like. You don't try to say, "Hey, where does it, where does they get this from? Oh, what's the brand name?" You know, you start to have all these kind of thoughts and ideas. And likewise, how does this go with this Kongan? Okay, so to show his gratitude, Chong Xing he will send ten cakes to Master Tao Wu every day. So what will you do? You start come come here to volunteer yourself as a form of gratitude. Someone just now mentioned gratitude, right? Yeah, remember? <laughs> okay. So after taking all the ten cakes, one thing funny thing that uh, Master Tao Tao Wu would do is that he would like he would ask his attendant to take one and give back to Chong Xing. Okay. So, um, you give one back to the, this person. Why? Okay. You know, if you are the one who give a, a person ten cakes, it means that you can afford it, right? So why should you return me one every every day? You know, then it does make him feel very puzzled. So. After so many days, he decided, okay, let's see what's going on. What's the reason? So he tell him again, the cakes are my gift. Okay, he said straight from my heart. It's out of my sincerity because you give me a room to stay. You let me, uh, you know, have a stand selling cakes over there. That's how I try to show my appreciations, my gratitude to you. So why you keep on returning one to me? What's the reason behind? Three, four, five, six, I don't know, maybe more than that. Then you return, hey, why you return this biscuit to me? And then the thing is that if you can give me something, why can't I give you something in return? You know, this is fair, this is a very fair world. So Chong Xing said that, well, since I can give 10 to you, why, why you care so much that I just give you one? 
you know I'm taking te nine, you know, and I give you one. So what's what so big deal about that? So this is seems like a number games coming on ten, one, that kind of things. Like what the title over here is talking about. So Tao La, no? Are you complaining that one is too few? Okay. If I have a complaint that ten is too many, how can you still complain that one is too much? Okay? So what's wrong is that to restore to you what originally belongs to you? So this is this main idea. So Tao to say, what's wrong is there to restore to you what originally belongs to you? This, again, if you take it literally, the word, you may think that he is referring to that particular biscuit. But we know that he's not referring to the biscuit. He's referring to something more. Something more that actually belongs to Chongqing. So is that idea. Start thinking idea. So, Chongqing, he was like, hey, what are you trying to do? You must be saying something. He is very smart. Chongqing is a very smart guy. And he find that, hmm, you must have some message that you want to bring it to me. So he decided to renounce and he asked him for further advice. What's going on? And so Master Tao will explain to him, okay, one give rise to ten, ten give rise to a hundred, and, and can even give rise to millions. All dharmas originate from one. So the idea of this thing of why he make use of this uh, biscuit to explain to him, he actually is trying to pass a message to him. But um, initially, Chongqing didn't understand why he returned this one. Because this one biscuit has uh, many meanings in it. Not only that it has um, like makeup from different causes and conditions that uh, make this biscuit possible, but also with this biscuit, it actually establishes a kind of relationship. Like for example, relationship with um, this Tao uh, and also relationships to whoever uh, buy those biscuit from from this uh, Chongqing. So this one actually can reach out to 10, and of course from 10 to millions. That's, that's the idea of this one. It's just like what we say that this um, one, even one single grain of rice is uh, due to different many causes and conditions. And within this rice, you can see a world inside it, despite that it's such a small grain. So this one, small piece of biscuit actually can give rise to 10 and from 10 give rise to 100 and even to millions. So it's a kind of ripple effect that you can't see and the interconnectedness between this thing. Within this biscuit, you never know that it has so many things inside it. Of course, the usual one we will say like, for example, the one who make it, the factories, the one who do the packaging, and then the shops will sell, and then the one who go and buy it, and then send it all the way here to Fo Guang Shan. And then, of course, there must be you, without you present over here, eating it, then you cannot make things complete. So, for those who haven't eaten, you can bring it back home. Okay. Now, the Commerce shows what? It shows the oneness of self and others. Like just now I say, because he made this biscuit, he sold it to somebody, and also he gave it to Tao. It's a kind of um, showing oneness of self and others. So through this small little biscuit, you can see the kind of um, relationship which if Maybe if you don't come for this lesson, you may know that you may not know that how how great this particular marshmallow is. It has so many meanings behind it. It has such a great significance within a small piece of marshmallow. And there's no duality between the subject and object. 
object. So it's not just like this is me, JT, and this is marshmallow. You couldn't really see a very clear cut line anymore. If you understand Chan Buddhism, they are actually interrelated. And since they are interrelated, um, this is not as obvious as whether there is a sub subject and object. And by allowing Chongxing to stay in his temple, Master Tao demonstrated what is mine is yours. So this temple may belong to um, this Tao. Wu. However, he let, he let this uh, Chongxing to stay. So it's a demonstration of what is mine is also yours. So what happened is that back in Fo Guang Shan, Taiwan, um, my teacher, Venerable Master Xingyi, he always say that Fo Guang Shan is mine. When he say it's mine, he means that sing on behalf of each other. So every time you ask, ask a question, um, Fo Guang Shan is whose? Then we will have to answer and say, oh, that is mine. Because why he says so? Fo Guang Shan doesn't come just because of one person. It's not established due to one person. It is through teamwork with so many devotees, so many people, and including his disciples, to make Fo Guang Shan possible. So he will be very happy whenever whoever tells him that Fo Guang Shan is mine. So the idea is similar to what um, Tao Wu is trying to demonstrate that what is mine is yours. If you don't have these feelings that Fo Guang Shan is you, yours, you always think that, hey, this is Fo Guang Shan business. It doesn't got to do with me. I'm not going to bother about that. When you can see the relationship between you and Fo Guang Shan, then you will happily say that Fo Guang Shan is mine. If not, you always think that, oh, this is just a place, it's just a temple where I'm going to worship. It's a place where I ask for blessing. However, you will never know that you are actually one of the people there and you are also one of them who can offer people blessing. You can always offer people help. So you become one with Fo Guang Shan. And when Master Tao accepted the text and we learned one to Chongxing, demonstrated that what is yours is mine too. So when you come over here, you come here as a, either as a devotee coming here for prayer, or you come in here as a volunteer, we also see yours as mine. Like what Venerable uh, Master Xing, he always say that, um, be a volunteers, volunteers. I know that sounds a bit funny in English. That means for people like us, we must first of all be your volunteer. So maybe you are volunteering your service. However, we also have to volunteer our service first. So what is yours is also mine. And then because of this, Chongqing awakened to the non-duality of many and few, whether it's one or ten. There's no differentiation between I giving you ten and you giving me one. And the differences between Chongqing and Tao Wu. And also the mind and matter, there's been the mind and the biscuit. And with and without. So he managed to get through these kind of ideas of being good and bad. So, like what I mentioned yesterday, when we hear the sound outside, I like it, I dislike it. So, this is sweet, this is sour, um, this is soft, and this is hard. So, one goes beyond this. But does it mean that when I eat this one, I will be not realizing this is soft? Does it mean that it's not good? It doesn't mean that you don't feel that this is soft, then it's called non duality. You still realize that this is soft. You, you still have this ability to recognize, however, you just, this is the very first thought that comes to mind. Yes, soft, that's all. But you don't have the second thought coming in, you try to interpret 
or the softness. I don't know whether your study science, how you're going to measure the softness of a mesh metal. You know, going to that kind of extent. So when your this kind of second thoughts come into play, then it's actually moving from um, seeing things as what it is. You already go beyond it. You are starting again what I mentioned earlier, all this interpretation, analysis, inference coming into play. So how does this come back to our daily practice? So, like just now we talked about one, one and ten. So we get to start with these neurons. Okay. So, like, I don't know what's the COE price right now. Those. So sorry. Sixty plus. Sixty plus. Yeah, because that day I was like, um, um, they are driving me and. To, to visit my my uncle and then they start telling me about all these um, things about COEs and whatever you know? all these numerous that make all Singaporean hearts start to beat right <laughs> even to buy cars and then I think there's a new loan system and right? you can only loan 50% right? something like that right. so this kind of um, new policies that the government come up that affect your life well, does numerous matter? Yes, indeed it does. We cannot say that, okay, after learning Chan Buddhism, I can don't bother about COE, I don't care. I want to borrow 90%. You know, the venerable says this is called Chan Buddhism, I don't care. But no bank will bother about you. They will only allow you 50% of the loan. Now, this is a, it's a very real situation. How are you going to work with this kind of numerals with your daily life? And then you start to feel unhappy because now I cannot renew my car, right? I cannot get a new one because last time I can use 90%, you know, to get 90% loan. Now I cannot. So you start feeling, oh, I'm getting poor now. And then things like even children. Okay, putting the children in the top schools. I remember the government a few years back they decided not to um, not to show the the ranking of the schools. Last time they used to rank right? yeah. like like uh, which schools in top and second, third, all these things. So they decided not to rank. However, I think I think two years ago my, my brother sent an email to me. Somewhere, some website actually show the ranking, right? Something like that, two years ago. And, and, and okay, out of curiosity, I, I tried to click into the link, but it was gone. So somebody has already stopped it from, um, again, trying so hard to rank the schools. That's what, even my brother is like, he get excited over this kind of ranking. So the, the parents become sad when their children don't get to the top schools oh, like nearby. I know I have um, friends who purposely go to the primary schools. Um, a few years before this, they enter into primary school, they start become volunteers, right? Or move house. Oh yeah, move their house. And all these things is really getting us crazy just because we want to make sure that our children get to top. Again, this is numerous about figures, that's what we want. They want to have a head start, think that this is good and whatever. So this attachment give rise to what? Give rise to the kind of unhappiness, worries, uncertainties, children also become stressful, the duality arises up from our mind, not from someone or something. I remember like last time, not now, because now you can't do much. Last time they used to have long queues. Now I don't know whether they still have long queues. You know, in front of the primary schools, trying to queue for the a, a, a vacant seat. So back in my time, my mom, um, she heard that okay, the the, the school that my cousin is studying is not that bad. She she actually don't know which is good school, that time when that's actually a top school. But all she heard was that, that that was a good school and that was an English school, English medium school. So what she did was that one day before the registration, 
she went over to stay in my grandmother's house because the school is near my grandmother's house. So then she will get to them first. So even at that time, that generation, you also already have people so kiasu. See, so our 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 parents already set the car precedence, you know, trying to get the best for their children. However, this kind of anxieties, because we have this kind of attachment. Of course, I I appreciate my 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 mom's um, um, hard work. Okay, you're not going to be able to speak English over here. I mean, in a Chinese medium school. Okay. So, this is the dual duality arises out from our mind, not from someone or something. So we think that okay, this is good. We must have it. We make sure our children get to the best schools. No neighbor neighborhood schools, no way, you know, that kind of thing. I believe there are many parents here, you can feel what I say, you know, the kind of anxieties. So, that's the part about your, this uh, marshmallow. How does a marshmallow got to do with your daily life? Now, any question with regard to the biscuit? Second serving? No? Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, my whole child must over there. Oh, feeling good. This is another one. Another one uh, by this, uh, again by this uh, Master Tao Wu, right? And he, he used to cry out, I feel great, I feel great, he feel very happy. However, one day when he was on a sick bed, then he decided, okay, to enter into extinction on what he called Nirvana. He said, so painful. Oh, I feel really terrible, very painful. Then the temple supervisor, go, go and bring me some wine to drink. Bring me some meat to eat. Oyama is coming to get me. Okay, Oyama is the one, what we call in Chinese, Yen Long Wang. Okay, the, the person who is uh, in charge of the hell, you know will come over and then try to get hold of him. So you were thinking that, hey, this person, is he a practitioner? At one time he said that he's very happy and then at, before the death day, then he started to say that, hmm, I feel so painful. So is he a awakened being? You start to doubt really, right? You feel doubtful. If one day, you know, you, I, I don't know, if one day someone, a great mom, you know, which you respect her, suddenly one day says, no, 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 I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And it's so painful, you know, that kind of thing. Then you start to doubt about him. So the supervisor say, okay, Reverend, all your life you cry out how good and how you feel and now why? Why you cry about the pain, so much pain that you suffer? Then the master said, okay, let's see. Was I right back then? Or am I right now? Which one is correct? When I say happy, am I correct? Or when I say I'm not happy, am I correct? Which one is correct? What do you think? Let's survey. Um, I think both are right. It's probably at that moment um, how the best, what does the person experience, and then they're speaking of in their mind how they think at that point in time. Okay. Don't you have doubt about this, Master? Uh, no. I think yeah. I think this was what is the uh, thinking of right at the moment. No, because I chose him. Because he's, uh, he's, he's someone I chose, that's why he must be a good person, right? What do you think? Same, because it's Chan. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Have a preconceived idea already. So what do you think? There's no right or wrong. There's no right or wrong. Okay. So no right or wrong. So, the, the supervisor 
was speechless. So you're not that bad. Oh, you give me some reply, you're not speechless. And the master just pushed away his wooden pillow and entered into Nirvana. So sometimes you may hear people saying this, and then another moment he's saying that. It may be because he or she is contradict herself or himself. However, over here, is it that he is contradicting himself? Let's see. Okay, so the explanation behind, I feel great is because he is really feeling very, very happy. That's why he say he's happy. And when he is feeling painful, he's suffering at his utmost, so he just say. So, personally, I feel that it's like you have to be able to see what your own feeling is like at that particular moment. You really feel happy, then you say you're happy. When you're feeling painful, you say you're painful. We know there are people who tend to hide that emotion. I believe some of you do, um, do have friends like this, or even maybe you yourself are one of them. However, when you're sad, you know, in front of other people, you try to be cheerful and happy. However, when you are, once you're back into home alone, you know, in your bedroom, then you, you actually, you finally, you face yourself, that you feel sad. However, over here you see Chan Master Tao, he don't care. He don't need to do that only in his bedroom. He do this in front of anybody. When you feel happy, he happy. When you feel sad, he feel sad. That's why somehow, even for me, when I, when I saw someone, you know, um, they feel very sad, painful because um, their parents passed away or because they are sick or whatever. I just, I just tap on their shoulder and say, it's all right to cry. I just tell them, never mind, it's all right to cry. To, to let go of your emotion, to face your emotion, to, to see that now you're feeling sad. I think there's nothing to hide. So that's something that we can learn from him. When he's happy, we say happy. When he's pain, he's pain. But again over here, what about the second thought? Does he have a second thought? You know, when he is feeling painful, does he has that kind of feeling of angry? He dislikes it? He hates to be painful? This, this has to do with our mind again. So you can feel pain, but you don't need to get angry with yourself. So sometimes like, you, you feel very, very, very painful and then uh, someone try to talk to you, you feel very irritated, and then like you're having a headache, and then somebody playing loud music, again you feel very irritated because of the pain. You already have this kind of anger, unhappiness, which is deeply inside you. So once there's something external to trigger you, maybe loud noises, the children playing, being noisy, whatever, immediately your kind of hatred will arise. So you are not really doing what um, Tao is doing, that means when painful, just feel painful, that's all. You don't add on some other things, like what we talk about um, the, the sutra when we talk about the second arrow, not having the second thoughts that's coming. So, Somebody has already hurt you with the first arrow. However, when you start to think why he wants to hurt me, why he's so cruel to me, these are the second and third arrow that you add on to yourself, not other people. When you're sick, when you're feeling uncomfortable, that's how it So once, um, there was once I was uh, having a bad call. And while I'm coughing, I suddenly realized that because the cough um, caused um, discomfort um, on my throat, and I tried to cough real hard. And this is not just a usual action of trying to cough real hard. I know that 
when I'm doing this action, my intention is to get rid of this discomfort. It's a kind of, um, I mean, maybe there's elements of hatred, unhappiness, dissatisfaction about this discomfort that has caused, that has imposed on me. So when I'm coughing, I really cough very hard. And once I realize my that kind of um, actions, my my reason for for coughing so loud is due to this kind of um, um, hatred or whatever. It was like I was really shocked. I was shocked by myself. Hey, well, actually, even simple things like coughing, you can see your so you can see that you have that kind of hatred within yourself, despite that you don't have a so-called a physical enemies over here trying to hurt you. It's an invisible one, maybe some germs or whatever causing discomfort. You see it, and so the idea over here, why I want to share this particular book, I'm also partly because of my personal experience once I was. Um, having a bad call. So when you feel painful, that's it. You just stick on to that and don't add on certain <coughs> other elements into it. So was I right back then or am I right now? There's no happiness outside of suffering and there's no suffering outside of happiness. Like the example I mentioned about the coughing, there's actually no such thing as happiness or suffering. It's just how you're going to perceive sickness, illness. If you perceive sickness or illness as something condition arising, okay, maybe I took too mojiti food or whatever, I've not been taking care of my health, that's why it gives rise to that kind of illness and whatever. If you can see it as that and take it literally as it is, you don't feel as bad. You Bodily, yes, that's how I'm going to feel. I'm going to feel bad, you know, feeling not comfortable. But mentally wise, I just accept this disease and illnesses. So the master pushed away his wooden pillow. It means suffering and happiness have the same source. It's all up to your mind. How are you going to see suffering and, and happiness? So Chan Buddhism in daily practice, once I read in a, uh, an article written by this uh, professor Zheng Shiyan, uh, maybe some of you have ever heard his speech before, his Dharma talk. And he has a very wonderful mother, um, a very wise old lady. She, she mentioned something like that. One day, um, Professor Chen asked about his mother. Hey, mom, how are you going on now? Because her mother is really old. And then he said, she said something. As long as we recognize that life is bound to have some burden and pain that comes with old age, then one would not feel unbearable. So her reply is, she's happy. As long as I put aside, you know, that kind of face that comes with my kneecap and then maybe my bone aching and whatever, other than that, you know, I'm happy. So she's a very wise lady. She knows how to differentiate, you know, what is supposed to be. As an old person, you may encounter, you may have face with it. You don't keep on dwelling as what you are when you're young. So like what I observe, most of the old people, when they couldn't walk, they actually refused to sit on a wheelchair. They still have this attachment that I want to have my mobility, I want to be able to move around. Why? We want to be able to control. So, the moment you are willing to sit on the wheelchair, that means you already declare being defeated. That you are no longer in control of your body, you lose control of yourself. Right? However, we forget that you know this body is actually going to deteriorate one day, so you have to 
you have no choice. You have to take the, the wheelchair and we keep falling on. So one day, Bangalore Master Shimin, when he was sitting on the wheelchair, he happily said, that, oh, now it's so nice. I don't need to walk. You know, there's somebody, you know, wheeling him around. So this is how a, a great master would think and feels when he faced with old age, when he faced with his own physical immobilities. He, he don't make this thing very angry or whatever. That's why he's able to write the one show called calligraphy. We have a um, uh, museum in the Nanking Institute. What we did was that um, we got some papers and brush, and then what we what we did was that we invite we invite the people who come to visit our museum to put on you know blindfold and then use the brush to write. You imagine if you cannot see how are you going to write all those words? And well, the response is very good. They say that oh yeah, this particular interaction give them has a feel what it is like if a person who cannot see and yet has to you know write all these words in very proper proportion you know so nice 